Welcome back to Mindset Hacks with Ita, a segment where we discuss and review relevant topics and give you practical tips to raise your resilience, mindset, and mental wellness. And on this episode, we have our first book review. We're going to discuss the book that turned Ita from a wandering generality to a somewhat meaningful specific. <laughs> wow, I love the vocab <laughs> use here. Uh. Uh, that was by Jim Ron. Right, right, right. A wandering generality or a meaningful specific. And I guess the word meaningful is a good reference because Man's Search for Meaning is mm. a book about finding meaning even in a tougher situation. Uh. Yeah, yeah. And just to give you a bit of context of what this book is about, if you haven't heard of it, uh, you should definitely go and read it. But we will give you a synopsis. Uh, it's actually set in the 1930s. Uh, during the World War Two. World War Two is forties. Okay, I think you better give an introduction of the book instead. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so basically, it's set in uh the forties, right? Uh, nineteen forties. But uh, during that time, it was World War Two, right? So, uh, Victor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist, mm. right? So, um, you know how Germans were per- persecuting the Jews previously. So, uh, because of that, he was thrown into a network of concentration camps, uh, in Germany, then getting shifted around and stuff like that. So, um. I personally cannot relate to being in a concentration camp, lah, right? But um, based on anecdotes and uh, based on uh, information online, uh, concentration camps are very brutal, right? You do a lot of physical labor, but um, uh, uh, uh but not enough food, uh, yeah. water. You you're basically in prison, but worse. Yeah, you're yeah. robbed of all human freedoms, uh. Yeah, food, shelter, water. You're made to work like animals. You're mm. beat up. Uh, you are treated less than dirt. Mm. Basically poor stuff yeah so uh so victor frankel was in that bad bad situation right but eventually he he managed to survive through it then then he he uh eventually was freed from the concentration camps after germans lost then um and because of that uh because of the experiences that he went through right of how why he was thinking about why people succeed Mm. in surviving and why people uh give up all hope and died and um and yeah, uh, so he used that to uh, write a book about his experiences, yep. plus um, observations, the observations. Observations, yeah, and also talks about um, how the experiences actually led him to create a, a psychological therapeutic method, lah. Called logo therapy. Logo therapy, yeah. So uh, uh, and he mentions like uh, through the experiences, then he he created a framework of how how it helps people, and yeah. it's continuing to help people. Yeah. There are like uh, local therapy institutions around the world, Yeah. And I must say also that this is a very best selling book in multiple countries. I think over thirteen million copies, or even more than that, sold because just the nature of it, how it's written, and the time at which it was set. And I I do want to read maybe a forward la, by uh, a rabbi actually on on his book, which again also reiterates what. Ita was mentioning. Uh, first of all, this is a book about survival. Okay, uh, Frankel approvingly quotes the word of Nietzsche, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. He describes poignantly those prisoners who give up on life, who had lost all hope for a future and were inevitably the first to die. They died less from a lack of food or medicine than from a lack of hope, a lack of something to live for. But Frankel's concern is less with the question of why most died than it is with a question of why anyone survived at all. Mm. So it's a fascinating book about survival and what keeps people going. Uh. So I think this is very relevant uh, for all of you, right? especially when you feel like, okay, we are not in concentration camps, <laughs> but sometimes maybe COVID makes people feel like that. Yeah. Uh, so I think if these people can gain certain lessons, so maybe we definitely can apply some. Uh. Mm. Um, so today the outline is very simple. We're going to highlight some key themes in the book and one, some practical tips, of course, uh, that you can adopt to boost your mindset and your, your wellness. Uh. So, uh, yeah, first of all, right, uh, Ita, just uh, what struck you most about the book? Because, you, I mean, we discussed Ita's story, I passed in this book, and it's one of the things that really changed his paradigm. So what struck you most about this book? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned previously, oh, the, what struck me most about this book, uh, okay, a bit context. Huh? So previously, uh, actually, I was... Like I wanted to read this book for a very long time, but I never yep. got around to doing it. Uh, I somehow, somehow one way I knew right that uh, reading this book will get me out of a rut. Like mm. uh, I was in a rut for quite a long time, right? In between, I know that I, I need to read this book, but I never got around to doing it. Sure. When I actually got around doing it, right, it, it really turns out. Uh, like, uh, so there's a weird clarity there. So okay. um, what, 
what struck me most was that previously when I was reading this book, I was searching for meaning, la, right? Uh, searching in life, uh, sure. like why, why am I, why, why am I living on this earth, right? Uh, there was a period of time where there was a lot of paradigms broken for me, right? So at that point in time, I, I realized that I don't need to go to uh, college to succeed, mm. right? Uh, I don't, I can chart out a path for myself and stuff yeah. like that. But at the same time, there was also a lot of fears, a lot of doubts that, um, cause it's, it's comfortable to hold on to things like, oh, I'm a student. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's comfortable to hold on to something like oh never mind I can I can I can still succeed right I can still finish my college and stuff like that so yeah. while I was struggling with that decision then I read the book then um so the book helped you quit school right uh, not not really it <laughs> it it helped don't me quit school a PSA please don't quit school uh it it helps me um how should I put it uh it pulls myself off the need emotional spiral mm. in the sense that what happens if I quit school then I don't right, succeed and right, stuff like right. that uh, and um, the feeling of being lost I see yeah I think the biggest problem for me back then was that I feel very very lost Okay. in terms of how, what should I be doing how should I how should I do this what's the meaning of life why am I even poor on this earth yeah. right um, and and reading that book really uh, pulled me out of it la. so even and, and the effect has been long continuous as, as I mentioned previously in my podcast also it's the fact that now even though our even though I'm searching for meaning and everything, uh, even though I still do searching yeah. for vision, searching for clarity, I don't go down that emotional spiral anymore. Yeah, like um, I still uh, there will still be ups and downs. Like I will still think that uh, why why should I do this right or um like uh, uh am I doing what I supposed to be do? But I don't go down that emotional spiral yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I think one thing you mentioned is that uh, the shift is that you stop asking what's the meaning of your life instead. You say life is the one that asks you what is the meaning of your life and life yeah. demands an answer. Yeah. I think that was one of the strongest things for me as well reading the book apart from other th- other themes like, like love and purpose which we'll talk about in a while but the strongest theme would probably be that yeah, life demands an answer from you. Like, what's the meaning of your life? Mm-hmm. So, and uh, probably the most enduring insight, right? I think we'll start with this, right? Is actually this thing called the power of choice la, that human beings right in such dire situations can still retain a vestige of spiritual freedom and an independence of mind la. and that's I quoting directly from the book mm. and that is what uh, his core, core one of the core things that he talks about in this book I want to read out to you his words because it's, it's much nicer than what I just talked about right but I guess this is common, right? Proactiveness, you know, you know, mm. we can focus on what we can control. But I think because of the context of this book, it just makes it all the more powerful. Mm. Um, so let me read this out, right? Okay. But what about human liberty? Is there no spiritual freedom in regard to behavior and reaction to any given surroundings? Is the theory true that have us believe that man is no more than a product of only conditional and environmental factors, be they of a biological, psychological, or sociological nature? Does man have no choice of action in the face of such circumstances? We can answer these questions from experience as well as on one principle. The experience of chem life showed that man does have a choice of action. There were enough examples often of a heroic nature which proved that apathy could be overcome. Irritably, irritate, irritability suppressed. Man can preserve a vestige of spiritual freedom and independence of mind even in such terrible conditions of psychic and physical stress. We who live in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken away from men, but one last thing, the last of all human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Yeah, so there you have it, put in a very poetic way that we can control our actions la, despite circumstances. That's why he's the author and we are not. La. Yeah, but that's why I read it off the book, right? So I hope you get some inspiration from there. Uh, we will talk about this, right? The question is, we know this, right? I think we know it for a fact that people can choose their circumstance, uh, choose choices. Um, not to say that circumstances don't matter. By the way, we all know that circumstances matter, privilege matters, but that's not a topic of this podcast, right? We uh, dealt with a hand of cards. We have to play it the right way. And so this is about how we play those cards. So the next question is, how can we do it? How can we make that choice even in difficult circumstances? And it seems like the book gives an answer. La. And the mm. answer is that we need to find a why to live for, a yep. mean meaning to actually live for. And so I broke it down as usual. 
<laughs> uh, into to just to keep the thirty minutes in into three things lah. Okay, the first thing is actually to dream and envision a future in faith. Okay, the the second thing is love, right? The highest purpose through which we live, and we'll talk about that later. And the last thing is to create meaning for your life lah. Um, and local therapy. So let's talk about the first one first. Uh, vision for future. So, um, yeah. Do you remember anything about about this book that talks about having a faith for future and how it links to you, lah? Personal mm-hmm. experience. Okay. So the, I I think for them the biggest, the the vision for the future really is just to either escape or be released, right? Because they yeah. have people that they are living for, right? Whether is it their wives, their children, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I cannot relate to that, lah. Right. Uh, but um. But yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this before. So in the in the previous podcast, is that the the quote that I always like to bring up, right, is that depression is always about not being able to see the future, okay. right? Not not having not having hopes for the future, yep. right? So, uh, definitely having something to strive for is uh is a biggest uh, is is a biggest anchor lah to yep. whether were you were you depressed and die yep. or yep. so as to speak, right? Your soul dies, yep. right? So one thing I realize also is that um. Whenever, whenever I'm not facing life, right? Yeah. Whether uh, I'm escaping or whatever it is, right? Uh, the biggest thing that kills me, right, is that even though I'm having a lot of pleasure, the the fact is that internally I know that there is no, there's nothing that I'm trying to live for, mm. and because of that, right, that actually spiral, uh, spiral, and it's, it's a more gradual process, lah. But the fact is that um, when when that happens, right, you naturally lost interest in life, in terms of uh. Uh, whether is it uh even want to go out, right? Or whether is it uh trying to do something new, right? Yeah. You just you just use the that amount of pleasure to numb yourself. Mm. And uh you can say that at that point in time I was dying, la, right? My mm. soul was literally dying, right? In the mm. sense that I I I really really just like space out. Like sure. life just goes on day by day by day by day. Okay. Yeah. So I feel that um so yeah, this is where I relate to what 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 was mentioned la, in the sense that the the vision for the future is very important. Having something to strive for, right? Yeah. Vision of the future, you you can say like hokey pokey, right? Like um, you look at the world and say, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna change the world, mm. right? Uh, or whether is it uh, tomorrow I'm just gonna go to work and be better, right? Mm. But the ability for you to be for better, to, yeah. yeah, is is the one that is, uh, that will that will keep you yeah. Like. Yeah. Even in the book, he talks about this. Uh, of course, it's in a more extreme circumstance, but he said that prisoners who gave up first mm. were the ones that with no aim. Who lost all hope for the future, lah. Yeah. And and they said that the mind and spirit are very closely connected. Mm. And once the mind shuts down, the spirit shuts down. The body also goes very yep. fast. Yeah. You know, and and I think faith, right? I want to touch a little bit on this because, like, you know, people don't talk about it a lot in modern day life, and a lot of people actually are living lives of quiet desperation, like you mm. said, numbing themselves, right? Uh, but. I I found it really fascinating that you know I did a project back in 2015 right about this thing called the road to nowhere. So we're supposed to take a photo and portray the the words the road to nowhere. So I took a photo of my brother sitting down in the reservoir, my dog on the right, bicycle on the left, and he's seated down on the road. On the right, right, it's just dark trees, dark trees, and on the left is just a row of lamps. So it's quite poetic because it's a symmetrical like center and then there's left and right, right? So I was trying to portray, right, the battle between faith and fear. Like. That fascinating, interestingly enough, right, faith and fear are more closely related than you think. Both of it actually denote a belief in the unseen. Mm-hmm. Differentiated only by how you define the unseen. In fear, you, de- you define it in the worst possible outcome. In faith, you see the best possible one. And interestingly enough, right, what you believe sometimes come true. So, you know, when I when I looked at this, I'm reminded of that. Like sometimes at one given moment in life, right, we have to choose between faith or fear. Like. We can't choose both in that given instance. Of course, we battle between the both. Like. But this book also talks about the struggle between faith and fear. Mm. <laughs> you know, and how some prisoners chose faith, what factors led them to choose faith and what factors caused them to, worse than fear, lose emotions and yep. just become like, Mm. Was he he in all in all words he said it became a digit mm. yeah. So yeah. sometimes sometimes you think that uh like negative spiral is bad for you, but actually I'll argue that just being numb to life might be worse. Uh. Mm. Yeah, like 
if you if you have a response for something is better yeah. than having no response. At least you're anything. fighting, right? At least yeah. you are struggling within yourself. Yeah. You want to find an answer. Yeah, like you are. You are. You are because you see the fight. That's why you are still fighting, right? Yeah. Worst is people just like, oh, I'm done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of people who are done, right? Good transition. I think he gave an example, Victor Frankl. He said that he once had a dramatic demonstration of the close link between the loss of faith in the future and dangerous giving up. So this person is a, a warden, actually had a strange dream. So Victor Frankl asked him, what is that dream, right? And he said that, oh, I had this dream that by February 1945, the beginning of March, I will be liberated. March 30th. So when he said that dream, right, when the person said that dream, he was full of hope, convinced his spirit was up. But when the war news came nearer and nearer to the date, it was very unlikely that we will be free on the promised date. On March 29, he suddenly fell ill with a high temperature. On March 30th, the day his prophecy had told him that the war and suffering would be over for him, he became delirious and lost consciousness. And on March 31st, he was dead. To all outward appearances, he had died of typhus. But we all know that that's not the case. Lah. Wow. So this is our goosebumps actually reading this because uh, it's just a classic example of how powerful hope can be, right? Mm. And false hope also. Yep. So let's talk a bit about false optimism and false hope. Mm. How is that demonstrated in our lives? Uh, actually, actually, I feel that um, because hope is something, it the, how should I put it? The hope, for something is very consistent, right? Whether you are hoping for something good or something bad, mm. or whether is it you are hoping for something real and something not. The the problem with that example is that he was hinging his hopes on something that uh that he has no control over. Right. Right. So this is the this is the biggest problem with uh sometimes what we go through, right? Is that uh you are hinging your hopes on something that you can't can't control and you can't right. can't dictate. Mm. And because of that, right, when uh, when it doesn't come true, then naturally there's the uh, negative side, right? If you if you think of, think of it as a spectrum, right? Uh, hope just means that you are going a lot of positive, yeah. right? But what happens if the hopes is not realized? Then you naturally go into a yeah. negative side. So it's a it's a it's the it's your body's way of trying to recalibrate, yeah. right? Um, so it, it comes the same way, right? Uh, you you may like for grades itself. I I agree that sometimes grades is not a very good place to hinge your expectations on, mm. right? Because the what you should be putting your hopes on, right, is that you will continue to learn, exactly. right, while exactly. you while you yeah. put the effort <laughs> to go and study, not yeah. that or oh, I'm gonna get hundred, yeah, yeah. right, because like sometimes sometimes it's also not your fault, right? Whether yeah, yeah, like yeah. if like if somebody if you no know, like liquid paper sometimes <laughs> leak over or, or whatever it is or some people imagine imagine the worst case scenario somebody lost your paper yeah, yeah, yeah. then how then you get zero eh? then yeah, how yeah. right yeah. or imagine if you fell sick the day before your exam yeah, then you yeah, immediately yeah. get zero then. Should you not study? No, you should still study, right? So mm. I would argue that pinning your hopes on the right thing sometimes is more important than having the hope itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think this links back to our first mindset hacks. Back then it was called life hacks like, yeah. that we did uh, on growth mindset. Yeah. Exactly what Carol Dweck actually researched that we should not hinge our hopes. Success shouldn't be dependent on outcomes alone. Mm. It should be depend on the process of striving, the process of succeeding rather than on outcomes alone. Because if you just hinge it on that, if you don't hit the outcomes, you get demoralized, you quit and everything. So I think a good remedy to this, right? Like what Ita said is to focus your efforts on things you can control. I always say, right, have no regrets. Focus on giving your absolute best, right? So that when the results come, you have no regrets. Yes, it's good to still have targets. I think it's important. Like for mm. example, in business, we have certain yeah, targets, milestones, uh, and, stuff, milestones yeah. and everything, right? But, it's also important to like work towards that. If that doesn't hit, right, we don't just like die lah. Mm. Like the person literally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I learned this like just yesterday. There was uh that one of my friends was telling me there was there was this study conducted right on the pers- the human brains, right? So the 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 conclusion of the study was that uh just trying alone, right, and failing and trying and succeeding, right? Your brain goes through the the, the same amount of change, mm. right? Uh, the ability to, the ability to operate a skill, right, as in succeeding in a skill, right, doesn't mean you are learning, mm. right. Just like succeeding in the test doesn't mean you are learning, okay, right. Um, the effort of trying actually is much more important than just succeeding alone. Right. Because yeah. success is just one event, right? Yeah. It's just okay. I'm, that's it. I get these grades, but the process is where your brains are constantly rewiring the neuroplasticity and all that thing is working out. That good stuff is working out, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I hope you all took away a practical tip uh, for this part on the vision for the future. 
uh, maybe before transitioning, right, how else do you think people can have a, a vision for the future? Um, how can people have a vision for the future? Just, yeah. um, I, I feel that everybody needs to have a right perspective, mm. right? Um, what you go through in life, right? And at, in terms of your growth, right? It's more important than what you actually ultimately get, mm. right? Uh, of, of, of course, things are important, right? Money is important. Please don't go and beg, right? Uh, <laughs> please, please stay in school, for example, <laughs> right? But the 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 change itself, the the growth in personally mm. actually should should be a larger priority. Larger priority, yeah. Because you cannot control. It's like uh, going into a relationship. You cannot control when you go into a relationship, but you can control how well you are as a person, whether is it how charismatic you are, uh, whether is it after being in a relationship, yeah, how, happy, you know? yeah, uh, how how can you continue to love people yeah. and stuff like that. So all these things you can control, mm. right? So focus on the things that you can control mm. and put your hopes on being a better person the next day and not you know, getting a million dollars the yeah, next day. Yeah, I really love that honestly because for me, my vision of the future is tied to my purpose, right? Which is to ignite the human spirit to love and overcome. And just knowing that every single day when I wake up, that's a chance for me to do that. Mm. It's not a cause, it's not like a fixed destination. It's a lifelong yep. endeavor that every single day, like doing this podcast, I'm feeling that purpose. You know, and I feel so satisfied and fulfilled from that. Whether I'm speaking to a youth, one-on-one, or even to a crowd, or even to an auntie selling tissue paper, I'm living out my purpose. It's something you live for. Mm. So yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so let's move to the next one. Another thing that Victor Frankl talked about that kept him going right, was, the const- was love. Like. Mm. And, and I love this because Ignite the human spirit to love and to yeah, overcome, yeah, yeah. right? So, so let's talk about this. And love was one of the things that got me out of depression also. But I want to read this particular passage, right? Where he says that he was on the road. He was working very hard. They were beating him up. It was icy cold. They had almost no warm clothes at all. And at this stage, as we stumbled on for miles, slipping on icy spots, supporting one another, dragging one another onward, and nothing was said, but we both knew each of us were thinking of his wife. Occasionally, I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds. But my mind clung on to my wife's image, imagining it with uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me, saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. Real or not, her look was then more luminous than the sun which was beginning to rise. A thought transfixed me, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is true love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in the world can still know bliss be it only for a brief moment in the content, in the contemplation of his beloved. Man, I got goosebumps reading that, man. That is just one of the richest passages on love I've ever read. Um, I know Ita maybe not have much experience with it, but I was still going to ask you anyway. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about this message? Um, okay, I really have nothing much to say. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. So I, I feel that love is a very important, it's a primal, actually I feel that love is a balance of both our primal needs and our logical mind, mm-hmm. right? In a, in a sense that um, naturally uh, affection and belonging to something is something that is wired into our DNA, mm. right? So having somebody that uh, that you can feel emotionally loved to, I, I feel that... Um, of course, it's going to ground you to something. I'm just going to speak nonsense right now. We are. No, it's, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense, right? So it makes sense. Yeah. Well, Utah is talking about how mm. chemically and biologically we are kind of wired to have a connection with, with someone else. I think that's important. Even last year, I felt lonely because uh, a mistake I made was just cooping myself up, right? Mm-hmm. Not making connections. And it's not just love in a romantic sense, yeah. but also in that's a general a, sense. Yeah, Some, sometimes we have to prephrase it. Yeah. Love yeah. doesn't just mean like, oh, being in love yeah. in a relationship. Yeah. It's, it's also about uh, whether is it to... It's the unconditional love. Yeah. I think that's what we are trying to strive for. Sure. It's the ability to to feel for people uh, in a sense that uh, whether is it... Uh, uh, doesn't have to be people also, like uh, maybe your pets mm. or even something they are trying to do. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. I think passion can also be counted yeah. counter as love. Right? The ability to... It, it comes back to... I, I think it ties back to meaning also. Yeah, in, yeah, in a sense that there's a... There's the... I, I feel that love is the reflection, the emotional reflection of... 
the meaning yeah. while logically there's also the, the other side la, which is like oh you can think that oh this is my passion this is sure. my vision yeah. I would even argue right? you might say I'm biased right but I don't care yeah. because we're all biased right mm. I would argue that the purpose of life is to love and be loved in return mm. that the mm. essence of life is love and I think Viktor Frankl was referencing the fact that many religions spirituality thinkers philosophers do say la, that we are love is the highest essence of being mm. that um, it's it's just I wish I could describe it better, but I cannot. Yeah. Um. I wish I could, but I hope you feel us because right. uh, I guess analogies I can give is even in my darkest moments, right? It was that unconditional love that I experienced from the dogs, from the volunteers, from my mm. parents that drew me out of that dark space. I, I, I just felt that, and in my life also, at right, the times where I receive the most fulfillment and connection is when I'm feeling love, like, and it always the paycheck, biggest paycheck. It's just hard to describe when you look into the eyes of like a kid and, and you, you serve them and they give you back that gratitude in return, right? You just feel your spirit in that moment. You just complete. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I realized that also is the, the, the emotional fulfillment is very, it's very hard to describe, right? Yeah. But if you, if you can show whether is it romantically, whether is it yeah. uh, service or stuff like that, when you, when you offer, uh, when, when you offer your heart to people and it's mm. reciprocated, right? In yeah. return, you, you feel like you feel complete. Mm. I feel I think that's the that's the best word to talk about. Mm. And I, I feel that human beings are always on the path of trying to feel complete. Right. And love is the oh, best way to talk about that's it. A, that's a good way yeah. to describe it. In fact, I'm gonna Wanna say something? Either. Right. So at this, at this point in time, I would like to do a PSA. Yes, uh, doing we, that. We, we, <laughs> we are not telling you to go and get a couple, get a partner or whatever nonsense. But uh, if you think that we are attractive, please <laughs> slide into our DMs. Uh, I'm <laughs> speaking. He does already speaking for himself. <laughs> right. Stop, stop. He does his simple PSAs. <sighs> but, but yeah, I mean, uh, you can argue like that is not our desperation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but whatever. You're shooting a shot. I think that's fine. I'm not going to judge you for that. <laughs> I'm not going to judge you for that. But I think, I think you know, romantic love is another form altogether. Mm-hmm. I feel that that is one area that you can live out your purpose or at least really discover more about yourself. Um, even though I guess some people, they don't get married and everything. So you can argue that, you know, you can still find it without romantic love. But it's a certain aspect of it that is very magical, you would say, that you can find it even in mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. other forms yeah, of right. love. La. And, and I guess this podcast is not about love. So I'm not going to talk in, deep, in depth about it. Uh, but I will. What I will do is actually read out another passage that Victor Frankl wrote, and he probably puts it in the best, posi- uh, much better way than us. Yeah. And I'm gonna read it out, okay? Because this is so poetic, and, and it's probably, um, yeah, I probably give some distinctions. So I'm gonna read it out. He says that love is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality. No one can fully, no one can become fully aware of the very essence of another human unless he loves him. By his love, he is enabled to see the essential traits and features in the beloved person. And even more, he sees that which is potential in him, which is not yet actualized, but ought to be actualized. Furthermore, by his love, the loving person enables the beloved person to actualize these personalities. By making him aware of what he can be and what he should become, he makes these potentialities come true. Mm. What an amazing... Yeah, yeah. It, it ties back to what we were talking about before that right which is the 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 hope and the faith for the future yeah. love is also talking about not just him currently mm. but also his potential and having faith that the it's person linked, yeah can can be better la, the it's, best version of it, himself it's absolutely linked because it's in love right that I saw a future that is because of the love that was given to me right that they saw that potential in me despite my entire situation that I begin to see that hope in myself mm. so it's very nicely linked, or honestly, love to uh, vision for the future. And that concludes our second part on love. And I think practical tip for this is just really to be more abundant in what you do. Like mm. give it our expectation. Give it our expecting anything return. Like Daryl would say, like go on a 30-day yeah, abundant, abundant challenge. challenge right? yeah, yeah. Like ask people, how can I help you without expecting anything return? Like give, try giving maybe, save up a little bit, like $5. Maybe they give to an auntie selling tissue paper and you watch the look of gratitude in her eyes when, she, when you do that then you experience and understand the essence of love. Yeah. yeah. So that's as much advice I can give you and just be kind to other people. Um, and the last thing right, to talk about is uh, meaning. Meaning. So how can we create meaning, right? It's a subset of purpose. Like. 
So meaning is very interesting because uh, I'm going to read this out again that Viktor Frankl wrote. Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather recognize that it's he who is asked. In other words, each man is questioned by life and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can respond by being responsible. In other words, it does not really matter what we expect of life, but rather what life expects from us. Mm. Yeah, okay. This this ties into a principle that uh, I believed in, uh, right? Mm. Whether is it... Uh, that means the, the ability for the person to take charge of his own life, right? Because... Mm. I, I realize that most of us, when we're asking what's my meaning of life, right? You are basically, while you're asking that question, your emotions is telling you that you just give up, mm. right? Is that you give, you let the universe dictate for you, but actually that's not how the meaning of life works, right? Mm. The meaning of life is what is what you dictate it to be and not what universe dictated for you. Mm. So that's the, the shift in roles there, sure. right? So the, the reason why this quote was like the big thing for me, right? Was because, uh, reading this quote subconsciously, under, I understand that it's just it's just up to me, right? For good or for bad, it's up to me. And this is this is what I feel people who are searching for the meaning of life need just need to realize that your life is just a reflection of your meaning, mm. right? Wh- whatever you think your meaning of life is, right? Uh, use your life to reflect it, right? Mm. Whether is it what you do, uh, whether is it the person you become, whether is it the food you eat and stuff like yeah. that. So, yeah, just just stop stop trying to figure out the meaning of life. Yeah. Right. Just just figure out the meaning of your life based on your actions yeah. and not trying to figure out what the meaning of life is. Sure. I think I think that's very useful. Um I would qualify also that especially if you're more religious or if you you believe in, in a higher power and God, personal God, right? I think do people find meaning in, in having like a purpose or broad purpose for them. Mm. But it's also important to, to know that uh, especially like, especially because growing up in a church, right? mm. I see some people because they don't feel connected to a meaning or yeah. purpose. right? Then they feel like, oh, I'm not as holy, I'm not as spiritual. And then they impose that kind of uh, that purpose on themselves. Mm. Um, and they feel a certain way. But I think that there is a way to marry both. Like. Yeah. Even if you're religious, right, you can still, yes, you have an overarching meaning of your life. For example, maybe it's to spread the gospel or to spread the word or to whatever that meaning is for you. Like. But you still have to kind of um, look at it in your own context as a unique human being, like how that is lived out, how mm. that meaning is being created in your own life. Yeah. So, uh, actually, that's partly the reason why religions work for mm. people who are who, who have mental mental health challenges, right? Mm. It's because uh, somebody dictates the purpose for you, mm. somebody dictates the meaning for you, so you don't need to think too much, mm. right? In uh, when you're in a spiral and you think too much, that's like the sweet mm. competition, uh, the sure. the worst combinations, right? But at the same time, if you are born into religion, right, then naturally you'll be searching, la, right? I, I feel that when you're in your teens, whether when you yeah, reach your sure. 20s and 30s, there's, there's the... There's a questioning and there's a search. Yeah, yeah there's an inherent inherent uh, need and want to search yep. for whether is it why you're on earth what, and stuff yeah. like that. So, um, th- as what you said, there's naturally a way to marry both together. Yeah. Um, the meaning of... Uh, Right, I just use Christianity as yeah, an example, yeah. right? So the I, I this I don't know whether this is true, but yeah, I, I feel that most Christians their 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 purpose in life based on what the Bible, Bible dictates, dictates yeah. is to is to uh, please God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in all that they do, but just being the best version of yourself mm. is pleasing God to a certain yeah, yeah. extent, to my understanding, yeah. la, Right, so just being the best version of yourself, use your life to reflect your purpose. I would argue is a is a good reflection to what. Uh, it, is, it, is, yeah. it is it is it is it is sometimes in the ch- just speaking in general like in the church is that sometimes we strive for certain ideals and then we don't meet that right we, we judge ourselves a lot and then mm. there's all kind of stuff which I won't go into yep. uh, but the idea is that it's like you have to still create that meaning and find that meaning for yourself and not mm. just let it be imposed mm. on you la. yeah I, I feel that the, the better way to describe it right is just uh, go through your life right but find meaning in what you do instead okay. of uh, waiting for the meaning to come yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I think I think also uh, let's go a little bit more into how this is applied on a day to day basis, right? Like what Ita actually mentioned. Uh, logotherapy. So logotherapy is something that Viktor Frankl created as a therapeutic mm. approach la, to people to help people, and essentially it means uh, finding meaning in your suffering or finding meaning even in your struggle. Uh, and he says this very clearly that it's not necessary. You do not necessarily need to have suffering to find meaning. Mm. Okay, but he said that in suffering you can still find meaning. Yeah, it can be a catalyst to find meaning. So I want to talk about that. Okay, how do we find meaning in that suffering? 
uh, maybe Ida just briefly before I yeah so I, I guess this ties into the idea that um, you are not uh, there are circumstances that don't dictate you lah, yeah. right in, in a sense that you you have a choice to whether to be meaningful or non-meaningful while in the tragic circumstances mm. right but we'll also argue that um, sometimes the negative uh, uh, Napoleon Hill said that mm. this right in every uh, adversity yeah, there's a seed or greater for equal, uh, greater, equal greater opportunity right so um, sometimes when we look at the tragic circumstance, right, our perspective is very skewed, mm. right? Imagine if you lost your job, right? Um, what's the what's the negative behind it? Because you lost your job, you lost your income yep. and stuff like That's that. Right. All these things become very apparent, mm. right? But have you thought about like maybe when you lose your job, right, you you have more time to yep. for for health for your family benefits and stuff like that. So there are be- definitely benefits behind negative circumstances, right? And uh, sometimes finding meaning during negative circumstances, right, is essential for you to be able to tie through, lah, right? Mm. So, um, this is where, it's like, uh, uh, because if you, if you go and understand more about lower therapy, right, it's, uh, there's like a battle in, in psychological field, lah, yeah. right? Whether is it uh, Freudian side, whether is it, do you believe that life search is just for pleasure okay. or the other side, mm. which is Nietzsche side, lah, which is um, uh, finding meaning, something that is greater for yourself and stuff mm. like that. Uh, I will argue that uh, you can be, uh, you you can having pleasure doesn't equate to having happiness, right? There's a there's a drastic difference between that. Uh, sometimes going through the toughest time, allowing you to grow bigger than yourself. That's where bringing happiness and fulfillment comes in, lah. Which mm. is which is what uh I feel that uh Victor Frankl is trying to talk about, which cool. is uh through these circumstances and becoming greater than your circumstances, then. That's the he meaning behind it. Yeah. You put it very nicely that he is actually talking about that. And he says that everybody has to bear their own suffering. I did not write down this quote. Y'all can look it up, right? But in roughly paraphrasing it, I love what's one of the quotes that I actually love in this book. He said that suffering to each person is unique. It's like a homo, it's like a gas. Mm. If you pump the gas into the room, right? It will take on the shape and form of the room, regardless of how big or small the room is. In that sense, suffering is like the behavior of a gas. It fills you up completely and poorly. So we cannot compare relative suffering to other people because to them, it, it is suffering. And by bearing it and overcoming it, right, that's where they gain that meaning and that distinction. Mm. Uh, and, and one example, right, uh, that's one aspect of suffering, like, finding that meaning in it. But another aspect also is, like you said, finding the benefit or the other side of the equation, which he helps people to do. So one example, he says that there was an elderly general practitioner who was uh, in severe depression and consulted him. So he could not overcome the fact that he his wife had died two years before la, and he loved wife above everything else, right? But now, how could I help? So, he was just saying that, uh, okay, so he was just basically very sad. So, Victor Frankl actually said, okay, ask him this question. What would have happened, doctor, if your, you had died first and your wife would have survived you? Oh, he said, for her, that would be terrible how she would have suffered. Whereupon I replied, you see, doctor, such a suffering has been spared her and it was you who have been spared. It was you who spared her of this suffering. To be sure, at the price that now you have to survive and mourn her. He said no word, but shook my hand and calmly left my office. In some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. In this case, a meaning of a sacrifice. Wow, again, who's when I talk about this? Because in my own experience, right, what helped me to recover from that deep crap and ditch that I was in, right? It's actually finding meaning in the suffering. Yes, I went into meaning after that, but I found meaning that, hey, by me going through this, right, I can start a YouTube channel. I can do what I am doing now. And that's why I have so much gratitude doing this, right? That I can eventually help others in a similar situation. And that is the meaning of my suffering. Um, and also linking it back to Adam Grant and Cheryl Sandberg, right? They wrote a book called Option B, which I also have. She says that, um, yeah, one of the reasons why people come out of suffering is that they allow they see that they can help other people in a similar situation. So yeah, I hope that, you know, all of you, if you're facing certain challenges, right, um, think about the people who are going through similar things to you and understand that when you embrace it, when you go through it, you not only develop a character that is more solid, you not only develop a, a sense of pride in yourself, but you also get the privilege to help other people in a similar situation. And I hope this gives you some inspiration, I would say, or tips, uh, in dealing with your suffering. Uh, well, I think I think we have come to the end. 
of uh, today's podcast again. We did not keep to the time, but I hope that you have gained some clarity and value from what we shared. Uh. Ita, I'm going to conclude with a quote that actually Victor Franco wrote about modern life and probably sums everything up really nicely. Mm. Okay. Don't aim for success. The more you aim for it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success like happiness cannot be pursued. It must only ensue. And it only does so as the unintended effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or a byproduct to one's surrender to a person other than himself. Happiness must happen. And the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscious commands you to do and to go on and carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see in the long run. In the long run, I say, success will follow you precisely because you have forgotten to think about it. So we say, go out there, find something to live for, visualize a future in faith, find people to love and serve. And lastly, don't just seek meaning, but go out there and create it every single day. Okay? Stay resilient, stay meaningful, and we'll see you guys in the next podcast. Bye.